Great, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm uh, super happy to be here in Nepal, Kathmandu. I've heard a lot about it. For me, this is extremely exotic place. And I've also seen uh, on, on Google Trends that, that Nepal is one of the countries where, where Candy Crush is super popular. So my, my uh, presentation uh, topic here is after half a billion downloads of Candy Crush Saga. And I, I'm, I'm going to focus a little bit more on Candy Crush. King has naturally made a lot of uh, games and we have a kind of portfolio of games. But, but since Candy Crush is so popular, that's where I'm going to focus this speech. But I want to start here, because this takes me back to my early days of, of uh, uh, development. Uh, I was at uh, Technical University in Stockholm, uh, and my, my, one of my best friends was also studying there. It was one year uh, in, in one class lower than me. And one day he came uh, to school with this, his new phone, a Nokia 6110. This was in 97. And it had a, a game on it, Snakes. And I've been a, a really heavy addict on games for a long time. And I, and I was making games as a hobby. But when I saw this, and it was a multiplayer game you could play. If you had two phones, you could play it against each other. I just thought, wow, you know, this is going to be huge. So I, I dropped out of university, even though it was a really good university. And, and I started uh, um, a company because I thought that this was going to happen straight away. As you all know now, and I hear from your laugh, it, it didn't happen straight away. It took many, many years before the mobile game industry actually started to work. In fact, it wasn't until Steve Jobs came along with the first iPhone in 2007, and the App Store was released in 2008. And that's when it was started to become possible to, as a game developer for mobile phones, develop the games and, and make it as uh, something that you could live out of. And so I'm very grateful to Apple for, for that fixing that, that market that didn't really work before. I, I, we struggled for a long time trying to release these Java games via uh, mobile carriers. And, and there was a lot of uh, work involved, but it didn't really uh, functional. Um, so yeah, this is a very dark picture, but it's uh, from the, uh, some of the guys in fabrication games. So this is me over here, depicted as, as a French resistance fighter in one of our strategy games. This is uh, another guy called Alexander Iakval. So it was him and me that started the fabrication game in 2009 um, to focus solely on, on what we called cross-platform games and, and, uh, and smartphone games. Um, this is something that made me really happy when I saw. This is uh, uh, the cover of Time magazine, and it has Candy Crush as, as a cover story, which was huge, especially living in those early days of mobile games and meeting other people from the games industry. We have a strong games industry in Sweden. And they were all always like, mobile games, really? That's not real games. You have to be on a console to, to make real games. And one great thing with this is my mother, is, she, she gets this every week into her mailbox. So I was super proud that uh, she had been worrying for many years about that I was playing way too much computer games. <laughs> and uh, now she, I could finally prove that it actually, this is something that is a big deal nowadays. So just some, some brief uh, numbers from Candy Crush. So today, as I refer to in the title, we have uh, half a billion downloads. That's actually quite an old figure. It's, it's one year old. It was for an anniversary of the mobile version. Um, and the reason why we haven't updated that number is that we don't really count downloads as, as a factor. We, we tend to look at uh, daily active users, which is an industry term. Of how many is actually playing the game? And an uh, uh, updated number is that we have currently 830 four million gameplays per day, which is a staggering, mind-blowing number. We're very happy about that, of course. But today's presentation, I'll, it's in three different parts. I'll take you through um, a little bit of the history of King. It's been around for 11 years, so it's actually not a startup in that sense anymore. And uh, I'll go through how, how Candy Crush came about and what type of, of uh, development uh, work was behind it. And then I'll, I'll speak a little bit about discovery 
and then continue to about what's happening now at King. So King started in 2003 and it was focused on online web games. And it was the leader in a small niche game industry which called skill games where you would have a one level game and this is Candy Crush, how it looks on that website. Uh, and you would play, try to get as many points as you could within a certain number of time. And you would be pitched against another player who was of equal skills. And uh, if you won, you could, you could bet $1 on this, and if you won, you would get $1.80 back. And this is some, still a very important part of our recipe at King for how we make games and how we innovate. And this is where Candy Crush originally came about as a, as a one-level game. I'll um, talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but so, so King was doing this for, for quite some time and, and was a successful company in doing this. It wasn't as big as, of a company as it is now, obviously. And throughout the years, we have made over 200 of these casual games. And uh, some of them are good games and some of them are not so good games. And this is an important part of our, our culture where we will have an idea and quickly bring it to market and test it on, on consumers and see if it works. If it doesn't, we'll, we'll leave it there and, and continue to focus somewhere else. This uh, fail fast is something that's kind of a tagline for Facebook that they use a lot internally and that's something that we also uh, try to work into our culture where we are not afraid of making mistakes and, and, and keep on, on innovating that way. But something happened in the end of 2010. So King were distributing their games via portals, such as uh, Yahoo Games that you can see here on the left. And um, that was all fine and dandy until Facebook came along and disrupted this industry. And people were going to see this curve is going straight down and they were instead going to, to Facebook as their first page of internet. So when Ricardo, our CEO, noticed this, he, he had a big speech for all employees and said we have to do something about this. And there was six parallel experiments started and one of them was called Bubble Saga and it took one of the games that we had called Love Me uh, and it made a social wrapper that we call a saga. And this is where this was invented in, uh, in uh, 2010. And you will recognize some of the elements here where you see your friend's progress and how many scores they are and what level they are at. And this is how they looked, those six experiments. Um, so we had a bingo thing and we had a, a, something called Funflow, which was kind of a publishing platform. And it's a little bit hard to see, but all this traffic here so this is daily active users. So how many people come in and play? So all this traffic is Bubble Saga. So Bubble Saga was, was a hit for us at the time. And it, it brought us up to 2.4 million daily active users with huge numbers. And we became the number seventh developer uh, of Facebook games. So the, the company was kind of restructured and focused more on, on this type of games. And we released many successful uh, Facebook games this is an infographics, as it's called, uh, that we released to the press, uh, bragging that we reached 10 million daily active users and we became the number two developer on Facebook. And here in the end, you can see Candy Crush being released as a Facebook game in April of 2012. But there was something else going on that on the market at that time, and that was that PC was no longer the dominant player for casual games. It was starting to become obvious that, that uh, mobile games uh, was going to be huge. This graph here is showing the decline of uh, PC, Windows PC cells. If you combine them, this is a really good graph that I found on Business Insider, or the data is there, at least I, I made a graph actually. But uh, here, the bottom you can see the PCs keep on growing as a platform but if you combine it with with the growth of smartphone and tablets you have a huge potential market this is a great way of illustrating this I think this is the installment of the new Pope in 2005 
and in 2013, so last year. And you can really see visually how the world changed in a short period of time. And you see a, an ocean of potential gamers that have a, a, a potent game console in their hand, which is uh, really interesting from a business point of view. So, yeah, that, that covers my first take on this uh, 11 years that King has been around. So more on making the actual Candy Crush Saga game. So as I said, Candy Crush started out in, in 2011 as one of our games that we have on the site. And we had already at this point made several Match 3 games before, uh, but this was our first candy-themed game. And uh, it was a, a team of three people who made this first um, game in Flash. And it looks similar to the game that you all recognize, but it is a little bit darker in colors and it's, it's a timed game. So you have two minutes to complete as many matches as possible. There was also one innovation with this, which is very important from the game mechanic side. And this was the first game where you could uh, make these uh, combinations of the upgraded candies in order to, to make the blasts and everything. And that changed the, the dynamics of the game. It looks like a pretty small thing, but, but it does a lot of change to the, to the game. And this is from the Saga version. That is not timed most of the levels. They're made on moves instead. Um, so I want to go into and show a little bit on how we work uh, continuously with, with the saga. So uh, this is um, from, from the map where you see all your friends. And if you dissect the part of it, this is 15 level, which makes up an episode. And we try to add one new episode with 15 levels every second week. We work with, uh, uh, with Scrum. So the, the team gets up and talk to each other daily basis and, and uh, discuss what's to do next. Um, this is a part of the map called the Lollipop Forest, which is levels um, 51 to 65. And one of these levels are pretty hard. Anyone knows which one? 65. Because we have a design vision where we want the last level of Candy Crush less level of an episode to be much harder, like a boss level from, from the traditional console games. Um, and the object of level 65 is to clear all the jelly behind the candy by making matches on top of it. And uh, you have a certain number of moves to do this. It turns out that at one point we had 40% drop-off on, on level 65. That means that 40% of all the players that we were getting into the game actually stopped playing here. Um, and that's not good. But the, the team that was working on the game, they didn't know that automatically. Because normally you don't. You have to make the, gather the data yourself and analyze it and see what is going on. So it, for us, it was the data analyst that found that this was actually going on, and, and they fed that back to the, the level designer. And I wanted to, I included a couple of slides on, on how the actual tool looks like. This is something that we haven't shown very many times. Uh, so this is all the levels. This is episode one. And this is also uh, web technology, and you click on it, and you get in Flash a rather simple level editor. So it, only three people has ever worked with this tool, actually. It's like we had three level designers in, in total. And then uh, he manually sets uh, what values there should be to get certain stars and, and uh, uh, works with this. And then the, the way we check whether it's difficult enough is if he can pass it without uh, having to buy something. That's another design vision that we want everybody to be able to, to pass without ever having to necessarily make a purchase. So what was, was done on this level 65 is that this uh, here in the corners were moved to just one layer of uh, jelly instead of two. 
and uh, that made a 50% reduction of the drop-off rate on this. So it had a huge impact. And since then, we, I know for a fact that four times we have updated level 65. It's still a very hard level, but uh, at least it's not that hard. But you can't please everybody. This is, I found this on the internet. <laughs> Whoever designed Candy Crush Saga level 65, I will find you and I will kill you. It's Liam Nielsen from, from the movie Taken. And I just want to say that I, didn't, I had nothing to do with that. This is the guy, if you're one of those people who we're looking for. So this is uh, the Facebook team. As you can see, there are not very many people, but, but there is a team working very hard on, on making the, the Facebook levels. And I've seen Tobias finish level 65 on the first try two times in a row, which is amazing to me. It's a super hard level. I, I barely passed it myself. <laughs> so. The vision was to make a cross-platform game, and, and uh, this is what I mean when I'm talking about cross-platform. So we have the game state saved somewhere on the internet, and we wanted the same gaming experience on multiple devices. So on PC, you're actually pl uh, playing a Flash version of the game, uh, and here uh, on, on um, mobile devices and tablets, you're playing a C++. Uh, version, but we try to mimic them as much as possible. We want it to be the same game, and so you can seamlessly go from one platform to another. And we see a lot of people doing that. They're playing on the on their cell phone on the bus or on the subway, for instance. When you get home, they maybe play on the the tablet instead. And we encourage that, right? You get a new set of life on each platform. So, so then your your five lives is not carried over if you, if you uh, end them all on one device. Um, and in the future, we can imagine some other uh, platform. I've seen a video of somebody running uh, Candy Crush on a, on a smart watch. It's obviously not playable because your, the interaction areas are much too small, but, but it runs, which was really cool to see. Um, other potential platforms might be interactive TV or smart TV as it's coming or, or even console. The, the philosophy we had at King was to, to include platforms where we have a massive amount of players. And, and so far, Android and iOS combines for more than one and a half billion users. So they are extremely much bigger than the other platforms. Um, so the game was reprogrammed in, in C++. So uh, we, Fabrication Games was acquired uh, in early 2012. And uh, at that point, we were, the, the, the work just started on, on the Candy Crush Saga version on Facebook and we started on the, the mobile version uh, that was, was rebuilt in, in C++. And this is a picture from the office that I took with my mobile phone. It's not super short, but here you see some of the guys working on, on that. So some of the challenges that we met uh, was one obvious one was that you have a lot of different screen size resolutions on, on phone, obviously. One great thing about um, the games that are on king.com is that they're all on a square play field. So we, we kept that uh, intact and then we just wrapped all the graphical user interface uh, components around it. And if you've noticed, you can actually switch uh, dynamically. I think I have a slide about showing that. Um, and that was something that uh, the device manufacturers uh, such as Apple and Google was very, very impressed by when, when we, sh we showed it to them. Um, another thing that is very different from, from PC versus phone and tablets is, is network traffic. You typically have uh, a more steady connection. If you have an internet connection on your PC that it kind of is much more steady than we have it on a phone, it's often very sketchy and it goes on and off. Actually, in Sweden, we have extremely stable uh, networks, so it's not a really good home market to if you want to make a global game, you shouldn't be too home blind, which is very easy to become because that's the environment you're in all the time. But when we looked at 
Candy Crush, we said if this is going to be really big, if it's going to be a great mobile game, it has to be available offline. So we'll try to make all the functionality so you, you'll have as much of that as possible when you're offline. So that delayed the development a little bit, but in the end that was absolutely worth it. We see that a lot of people are playing typically in the, in the underground in London or, or the subway in, in New York, where they don't have a lot of other entertainment form to, to access easily. The user behavior is very different on a mobile phone. You typically want to go about your life very quickly. Uh, if, if you're on the bus and you need to get off, it's, it's not good to play a first-person shooter uh, type of game because you need 100% of your mental bandwidth to play that type of game. And you, you can clearly see that if somebody's playing uh, a game like Battlefield and, and uh, their wife is, or girlfriend is saying something to them, they're extremely disturbed because you, you get out of the flow and you need to really focus. Whereas with, with the, the games that, um, the casual games that we have uh, done, we have it based on moves instead. So you can at any time look up and, and have a conversation going on in parallel, which is really helpful. We also spend a lot of time making sure that it's really easy to start and stop the game. Those things are, are very important. Uh, before, when we were working, I've seen a lot of uh, demands from, um, if you're working with a console and they have different demands on what you need to do to, to um, satisfy the, the rules. And it can typically be that you have to pop up, are you sure you want to quit? And yes, and then you exit to menu and then you have to go out from that. And that's extremely frustrating as a user. You need to really focus on how to provide the best uh, possible user experience. And the last but not least is, is discovery that I'll, I'll, I'll pop into briefly and, and talk about that too. Yeah, so here is the slide that shows uh, really well the, the square play field in the middle and then we just wrap the GUI components around this. That makes it really easy to play the game with one hand or with one thumb, which is, is really good for, for a mobile game. Um, and we took a lot of care also to make sure that if you're on tablet, you, you really shouldn't just look at the tablet as, as a, the same device as a phone, because if you're on tablet, you typically don't reach the entire screen as easy. So we really go into and look at the tablet as well as a, special, as a other type of device. So this is what happened after the launch. Uh, this is a graph that shows the, the traffic that we have, the daily active players. And uh, the blue area, it's not super easy for you to see, is the Facebook traffic we had. And here we launched the mobile versions, and that's this part, different mobile versions. But what is really interesting here is that we had exponential growth in the Facebook traffic as well. And that's basically just because it became a much, much better game. Because you had, uh, all of a sudden, you could bring the game everywhere. You had much easier to show it to your friends. So we had a, a huge spread of the game that people were, were showing, you know, you need to download this. And retention went up a lot. People were keeping playing it much more than they were before. And monetization was also better. So this graph is something that is uh, really uh, fun to look at. This is from App Annie, and I just searched for uh, top grossing ranks in the US store for iPhone games. And this is Candy Crush. This is the launch date. And here is until uh, two days ago or something. So it's been a fantastic ride, and it's, it's been really fun to work on, on a project like this. So just to, to recap what, what went really well with, with uh, Candy Crush and, and, and why, why it became this global phenomenon. So first of all, I, I can't stress enough how important it was that it was an approved game mechanic from the beginning. Like We already knew that the base of the game, the core, worked really well. We, we tested that in an early phase, and we saw that people liked it. And we re already had uh, retention values from the one-level game that was made years before. Right? Uh, because games are extremely hit-driven, and if you 
take your entire company and, and bet everything on one game and you, you wait out and you work with it for half a year and then you release it and it's a lottery ticket. If you can reduce a little bit of the risk, that is, that's great. And, and our way of doing that was, was testing the core mechanics on, on this website. The candy theme has worked really well as, as a global concept. We see uh, one thing that's important to know is that we test the games, uh, the first one level games, on uh, a female audience mainly. They are mainly women between 25 to 55. And there's a couple of things there. There's not many people making games especially for that target audience. So they are not, there is not so much competition there as there are for, for young teenage guys. There are so many people already making games for, for them. Uh, so that is part of the success. Later when we saw who is playing Candy Crush, we saw that it, it works really well for everybody and that we, we, we tried to make sure. But the fact that it works well for women is, is really good. Accessibility is something that is extremely important. Uh, the the cross-platform I talked about, the fact that if you tell a friend that this is a really cool game, you should try it out, it's very important that that friend has a device that makes it a meaningful conversation. Um, it's free to play, which makes the... It's so much harder to try to convince your friend to pay for something. If, if the only thing that they have to put in there is time, then it's much easier to have that done. It's also extremely easy to understand once you download it for the first time, and maybe you need to pass the first two levels before you get into it. But once you've gotten into it, you understand how it works pretty well. And we, we spend a lot of time and effort on those first 30 seconds. And as, as a game designer, I feel there's nothing I learn more about than standing slightly behind somebody playing my game giving it to them, not saying anything, and looking at how stupid I, I feel that they are, that they don't understand what, I, what is obvious to me because I've been working so hard on something. They're not stupid, of course. It's, it's, you get home blind when, when you're working on a project. And I've seen this so many times in the projects we work on. It, it, it feels obvious to us, but then it's so simple to make something uh, to, to help that. A uh, good example is to just shake a button a little, if you need to progress, if you move that button, then it's much easier to see. Um, then the fact that this game is a social game is, is very important. That uh, This category of social casual game has a really long lifespan. If you look at a lot of the mobile games, you typically download them, you play it a little bit, and then you download next, and you can't even remember which one you're playing. But with this, the two and a half, or now two years in with the mobile version of Candy Crush and it's still a really big game, which is great to see. And one of the reasons is that it's just so much more fun to play when you have friends and family in the game. And this is an important part, the fact that we continue working continuously with the game and updating it. And then having games as a service is something that is really important. And it's difficult from a game company perspective to to have a business model that, that fits this. But uh, it's, it's gaining in popularity a lot. So this is from Google Trend. This was what I was talking about uh, early, that uh, in Nepal here. Uh, the darker it is, the more popular it is. And this, here you can see how, how the game has spread a little bit. It's not 100% accurate, but this is just going in on Google Trends and looking on how many people are searching for Candy Crush. But uh, Nepal is, is in the very top of, of, uh, <laughs> of where it's popular. So that's, that's great to see. And uh, it's really fun to get out here and, and listen to, to some of the stories of, of people playing it. Otherwise, this, uh, the, where it's popular also uh, intersects a lot with the social networks, right? Where, where, where Facebook is really strong. So. I, just, I had a couple of slides about the game. Some questions I often get from journalists is, is uh, why, you know, they, they ask about the game, could you give me some advice on the game? And, or uh, they, they're in a situation where they are certain that the game is cheating. They just had one move left and it wasn't the right candy. And then they think that we did that on purpose so they would have to pay. But that is not so. So the candies are added onto the board completely randomly. 
So we don't know what's going to happen. And the fact that it's random is very good. So it's, it's a certain bit, uh, bit of skill and it's a certain bit of luck to, to pass a level. You, there is no guarantee that you could pass level 65 on the first try every time. Um, but if you're skilled at the game and you are making more matches in the bottom of the screen and, and you're good at spotting what could be a, a good move in advance, then you can become a lot better at it. So the blinking is completely random, the hints that you see. And some journalists often ask me, why, why are you not showing the obvious, the best? Because here, for instance, there is a four in a row. That's much better than this one that is blinking. If we were showing the best all the time, it wouldn't be a game. Because it's a limited number of moves, you'd just be waiting until you saw the hint. And you, it, would be, it would be a self-playing piano. So that doesn't really work. And we treat all players equally. So we don't differentiate between paying players or free players. It's an important thing that we, we said in the company that we want this to be a real freemium game. You should be able to make it to the end uh, without ever having to pay. And in fact, of the people who are on the last level, more than 50% didn't pay to get there. But there is today more than 700 levels. So don't ask me how they got there. I, I haven't reached level 200 yet myself. <laughs> is there anyone in the audience who is on the last level in Candy Crush waiting for an update? No? You need to play more Candy Crush. <laughs> so another common question I get is what, what went wrong in this project? And, and I, I have to honestly say there wasn't a whole much of things that went wrong. It was one of those times when the stars were aligned. I've been working for 15 years with mobile games and, and none of the other projects that I worked on really became super hits. But this became a really big hit and, and that is much because everything just connected perfectly with timing, smartphone became a really big global phenomena, um, Facebook games for mobile was getting big and, and there was many things. But some things, I asked the team what, what, uh, if they could come up with something that actually were problems. And one interesting thing is that the original one level game, the small flash game that we had on the site, the, the Facebook team continued with that code, even though the, the coder behind it was not lo no longer uh, in that team. And looking back, we'd saved a lot of time if we just had restart from the beginning and, and, and program everything again. It's called technical depth. And then there was a lot of things in the code that turned up to be bugs that we weren't aware of originally. And as I said, the mobile team and the Facebook team, two different teams. So. Uh, we had uh, two different code bases and at one point scores were calculated differently because one team didn't tell the other that they had changed something. So uh, what we did is we moved the team together so now they are sitting next to each other and, and, uh, and interact more easily. So the last thing, and I won't spend too much time on this, just discoverability and, and marketing and branding. If you're, if you're new and you're coming to App Camp because you want to develop games, this is not, shouldn't be one of your first concerns. If you've been in the industry for a while and you have some good products and, and you want to know how to, to get through the, these millions of apps that's out there, then you are having the same problem as a lot of other app developers. So I'll, I'll briefly go into some of the things that we did with, with Candy Crush. One of the things that we did was, was to use a lot of channels at the same time. So we worked actively with PR at the launch. We, we went and spoke to journalists, uh, games journalists, uh, had a lot of reviews being made. Uh, uh, we had Facebook traffic, obviously, I'm going to go in and talk a little bit more about that. We had, did a lot of banner advertising in the beginning. We did almost no TV advertising that we are doing now, or we didn't know uh, TV advertising. Just digital advertising where we could follow how it worked. Uh, nowadays, cross-promotion is a big thing. And we actually, we were, of course, cross-promoting Candy Crush from the Facebook game. The Facebook game was released first, so we already had millions of users when the mobile game was released. And we could say, you know, this day the, the mobile game comes in. So the first weekend we had a lot of downloads and we pretty soon reached uh, the top chart. And from reaching the top chart, you get a lot of extra downloads because you get a lot of visibility from there, of course. You can pray or hope for a feature by some of the device manufacturers, Google or Apple. 
but that's something that you can't you buy your way into. So that's hard to, hard to affect. There's a couple of things that you can do. If you look at what's important to them and try to, to make your game accordingly. They are, if you look at Apple, for instance, they typically sell hardware. That's, that's the, a lot of the mindset behind it. They are primarily out to sell new models of their uh, devices. So they really like things that is showing off um, how beautiful things look on the screen or how fast their graphics processor is running or things like this. Um, so these are some graphs that just brings me to a conclusion. So if you look at the app book face discovery, it's mainly viral. So friends inviting friends. You all like when you get this uh, Facebook request I heard from, uh, <laughs> from some of the feedback I got. You want more? I'll, I'll go and ask the team to tune it up a little bit, four times as many messages. No. Uh, but app discovery is mainly driven by the app stores themselves. And uh, here you see uh, the, this is iOS, the, the top one, and the bottom one is Android, and look very similar. And about 35% is driven from, from people going into app stores, discovering app that way. But one thing you can use and utilize, and that's what we did, is the, that over 50% of the smartphone users are using Facebook on their phones. And that's a lot of people. Uh, and this is something called deep linking, which is basically, um, if you have somebody playing, a, say that it's another game, this is a Bubble Witch Saga, but if it was a, a card, collectible card game, for instance, and you want to make a trade with one of your friends, because you have found that special card that you know he wants, and it doesn't make it meaningful to you. So if you send a request to them, um, they get a pop-up in their notification on the Facebook feed. And this goes from desktop to mobile and vice versa. So it doesn't matter really uh, what device you're on. If they click this, if they have the game installed, it'll take them directly to the game and you can send parameters in there so you can actually get them straight into that trade that you've proposed. If they don't have it, they will be taken to that app on the App Store. And this works both on Apple and Google. And this is an extremely powerful loop that you can uh, help your players uh, to, to, uh, to promote the games to their friends. And Facebook has a, a lot of other uh, technology that you can use if you want to advertise your game, uh, such as notification and feed. But I'll, I'll, I won't bore you with that. Um, another thing that I thought was worth mentioning, this has been something that worked really well in Candy Crush. The, uh, the fact that you can ask three friends to, to unlock the game. And you have to wait until those three friends uh, go in and, and help you. It's, it, it both serves for promoting the game uh, because you have to wait a little bit and you want to continue and it's a little bit frustrating. So some people just pay the one dollar and continue. Other people do what my mother does and she calls me five seconds after she clicked that she wants to continue. So it's like, why are you not on the <laughs> candy crush and then uh, letting me pass? And so I, I go in and do that. Another thing that, that I thought was worth mentioning is, is uh, we now have a, a fan page on, the, on Facebook with, with 74 million fans, which is one of the biggest uh, fan pages for a game. And we communicate with them directly. We get a lot of feedback for the game. And then uh, we do some fun things. This is a picture that I helped out facilitating on some kittens playing Candy Crush, which was really fun. And we put it up there, and it was shared. Um, so that brings me to the last part here. Uh, so what are we doing next? What, what, what do you do after you have a success like this? Uh, so we have been growing the company quite a lot. King was uh, about 100 people when, when I joined in, in the beginning of 2012. And right now it's 1,100 people. And we have studios in many different countries. Uh, we have a studio in London that makes Farm Hero. That is also a very, very popular game from us. And uh, in Barcelona we have something called Diamond Digger that they're making there. 
So that has been one of the strategies. Another strategy has been to work especially with the Asian market and some, some of the key countries there and look at uh, Korea, uh, Japan and China as three separate, uh, rather complex but very powerful and interesting markets. And one uh, really exciting thing is that this week in two, Tuesday we released a sister title called Candy Crush Soda Saga, which is a tongue twister. Uh, and that's a, a, a new, really fun version that uh, also is made up of the Stockholm studio that we're very happy about. So it'll be exciting to see where that goes. And you can download it now if you want. No. <laughs> uh, so just to summarize, some of the key success factors for King has been this repeatable formula of, of uh, making new IP, so intellectual property. So what I mean there is that we have kind of lowered the barrier for ourselves where we can come up with ideas and try them out really early on, uh, which has helped us coming up with new concepts. We have this cross-platform architecture and we have a large growing network of players. So now when we release titles, we have uh, players in our network that we can cross-promote similar titles to, which is very helpful because it's uh, very expensive to acquire new players. That summarizes this presentation for me at this point. Thank you. <laughs>